Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now to your host. Welcome to the Democracy That Delivers podcast. My name is Tamari Zosenidze. I'm a program officer with Site Policy and Program Learning and oversee the Free Enterprise and Democracy Network known as FEDIN here at Site. As part of last year's FEDIN conference, we held regional exchanges, which were an opportunity for members and partners to get together and discuss challenges and opportunities within their respective regions. I'm excited today to be joined by two of our FEDIN members, Reiner Hoifers from the Center for Inter... For In... Ah, okay. Sorry. (laughs) I am excited today to be joined by two of our FEDIN members, Rainer Hoifers from the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies and Robin Sitola from the Samriti Foundation based in Nepal to delve deeper into Asia. Welcome both. We're thrilled to have you joining us. Thank you very much, Tamari. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Tamari. It's a pleasure and honor. Rainer, why don't you go ahead and get us started with a bit of an overview of the region? Sure. What do you see as some of the challenges and opportunities that we're facing? Sure. Thank you so much. Let me just put it in a nutshell, because obviously talking about Asia, you could talk for hours. But in a nutshell, um, what we see on the on the on the economic side is that it is really becoming one of the core centers of the global economy, if not is already. Uh, So what we have is we have the two economic powerhouses of India and China. And um, we have a lot of, if you want, other country satellites around it that actually uh, benefit tremendously from these giant markets. Um, This has implications, obviously, also on the political side, having these large nations so close. So what we also see is um, on on the democratic side, we see a certain erosion across the continent. Uh, Largely in Southeast Asia, we see democratic spaces shrinking, which has a bit to do with looking at the neighbor China and how they do it and in a way feel legitimized to also implement some of these policies. And at the same time, we also see in South Asia, and obviously Robin would know much better about it, but also we see a tightening space for civil society over there. And in the interesting case of Bangladesh, in a way they overdid it and it boiled over and then people were so discontent that they actually removed the government there recently um, in Bangladesh. So what we see is really economic strength. A couple of people now start calling a new region, Sasia, which is South Asia, Southeast Asia. So those two combined, South Asia and Southeast Asia, are motors of global economic uh, um, strength. And uh, this is really definitely worthwhile watching, especially when we're going to talk about investments, uh, because they are attracting large amount of investment that is at the moment also exiting from China. Um, And at the same time, we still have some very stable uh, regimes, if you want, in Japan, South Korea and Taiwan. So this is also, of course, part of Asia. um, That we have those that are consistently delivering with their ups and downs. Um, but uh, this obviously also is a, an in, important factor within Asia because they are competitive powers. They are competitive powers compared to what China is delivering. So um, people have an alternative to turn to Japan or Korea if they want to reduce the uh, dependence on China. Thank you. Robin, I'm not sure if you have anything you'd like to add to that. Well, I mean, uh, uh, Aran has put it very nicely and very aptly. Uh, the only thing I'll probably add is, um, you know, Asia is very, very big. Turkey to, you know, all the way to, from Turkey to Japan. And it's very diverse. And diversity reflects in everything, you know, from from religion to politics to governance. And we, we have samples of all kinds of states and, you know, economies. So I think, Rana, you put it very well. Thank you. How would you characterize the trust that people have in liberal institutions? Are they attracted to any competing visions? In other words, do you think people believe that democracy is delivering? Well, uh, if I would have to re- respond, I think Asia, uh, uh, you know, given... It's really given religion and history and, 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 and politics. We really don't know which is 
which actually is a liberal democracy in Asia. It's very hard to say if there is a real liberal democracy, um, you know, a state with a liberal democracy in Asia. Because it's, oh, it's, it's often been tumultuous. But, but we have democratic states and we have states or countries that have implemented, um, uh, you know, market-led um, economies. And so there, there are quite a few uh, of them. Uh, and then if we look at, you know, if we look at democracies, let's just call it democracies, and, and, and we have all kind of samples of those democracies in Asia, uh, we've seen that there are, um, you know, there are some countries that have been uh, always regarded as, uh, you know, guide star for democracy like India, right? I think one of the world's largest democracy and alibet liberal democracy for a long, long time. But if you look at India in the last, uh, you know, 10 um, uh, years or in the last two decades, uh, kind of, uh, it kind of feels a little, you know, alarming that uh, the, the civic space itself has uh, decreased in India, whereby economically they're doing quite well. Another big democracy in in um, Asia is uh, is Indonesia itself, which probably Reiner is better, you know, uh, positioned to talk about. But at the same time, we also have extremes like uh, North Korea and and, and China in in, in Asia. Uh, and then we have like every everything else in the middle, like you know be it Pakistan or Afghanistan or other stands and, you know, many countries in Asia. So uh, so I think the state of, uh, you know, governance or state of democracy in, its, in uh, uh, Asia itself is very diverse, uh, Tamari. I and I, I fully agree. And I would like to add a few thoughts. You know, democracy, if you just say democracy, then I'm just thinking this is just a decision-making mechanism to me. But liberal democracy, that's a very big difference. A liberal democracy is basically one that constitutionally limits the power of the government. And I think that's very important to remember. A liberal democracy constitutionally limits the power of the government. And that's where, not just in Asia, in many continents, but also in Asia, governments struggle to accept that. And also, a lot of citizens are quite unaware of that. So it's not uh, it's not just a human right to have the freedom of expression, but it's also a liberal democracy that would not give the government the power to interfere with the freedom of expression. And so this limit is something that many governments in Asia, other continents as well, would struggle to accept. And when Robin was just talking about India, that's one of those where do you see the Indian government less and less willing to not exercise the power that should be constitutionally limited in a liberal democracy? But then you also mentioned trust. And um, so that's another interesting dimension here, trust in, in the democracy in Asia. And I was really thinking, so what is it? What does it, what, what are the factors that would determine trust? And Robin, and I would also be interested. What do you think about that? You know, I mean, I thought about five dimensions, basically. So one is the, 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 the perception of the effectiveness of the government addressing economic and social issues. So people trust if they feel there is economic and social progress. Now, the other one is the perception of corruption. The people trust if they don't think the money is abused and stolen. Um, people trust if there is stability, political stability. Uh, and they trust if there's freedom of expression and they trust if there's an electoral integrity so that they feel that their, their, their voice is really heard and counted. So there are so many ways of undermining trust. And you have rampant corruption, you have um, infringements of freedom of expression, but you do have some political stability. So Asia, I would say on all these five levels, has lots of problems, but also scores quite well in others. Very well put, Rainer. Um, let's just start with the with the issue of trust. Uh, well, I <clears throat> I do I do agree with you. At the end of the day, you know, trust is something that translates to uh, you know people to citizens, right? And uh, coming back, uh, you know, coming from a country like Nepal, 
that has quite a young democracy, one, uh, and two, uh, the recent years, like in the last uh, 15 years uh, or 20 years, we have, uh, we have gone through a very tumultuous time and we've kind of corrected our own course of direction of democracy and established a more democratic, technically, a more democratic state, as in we've, from a unitary state, we've become a federal country. Right. So that is to me, that's more democracy, you know, going from a unitary, uh, you know, kingdom to becoming a federal state and, you know, and 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 constitutionally agree to devolve power to the grassroots. Right. And so uh, in, 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 in our practice of how how our federalism is going on, uh, we're seeing that trust, the translation of the trust that Reiner mentioned about. So currently we have. The size of our government is very, very big. Uh, we have about 761 governments that have authority to um, authority to legislate. Okay, one would be the central government, federal government, and then there are seven provincial governments, and then there are 753 municipal governments that have the authority to legislate. Okay. And they also have their uh, the the local governments or what we call the municipal governments have, you know, units in their like you know territories, smaller units in the territories that are called the wards. We went around uh, last April. We went around uh, uh, around almost half of the country, traveling by road and talking to people, and you know, meeting elected officials and all kind of people. And what we found was, these people were very happy with the closest government they have, that is the county level government. And they felt that this was a real democracy because this government was responsive to them. They were getting their, you know, registration, they were getting their social security benefits, and pretty much they didn't, they, I mean, normal people don't have to go anywhere above that level of government, which is in thousands, a number of thousands of units in, in, in Nepal. But then what they were complaining about was larger things, you know, larger things like um, uh, court systems, like bigger court systems, because court systems are delaying to respond, right? Or they're, compl they're, they're complaining and uh, they are um, a bit skeptic about, the, about what federal government does. They're skeptic about big businesses, being, uh, you know, being charged of corruption or, you know, being scandalized for corruption, whatever that might be. So they're, they're kind of, perspective of the, uh, skeptical about the bigger things, the bigger governments, but they are they're quite happy with the smaller government that they have close to your home. So that makes us realize that for the Nepali people that we met last time, it was the responsiveness of the government in terms of delivery of services for them. And this, these are very simple services they have been deprived of for a long, long time. Um, it could be immunization, it could be citizenship, it could be passports, all this thing. And so for these people, they really think federalism is worth uh, at, the, at the very local level. And they, they think that the provincial government, which is our you know, second higher government or state level government, um, uh, is not of much importance because they don't have to interact with them. They're far away. So that was that was our you know sort of um, uh, that was uh, our uh, finding in a way or impression in a way traveling across Nepal and how uh, it was you know the sense of delivery uh, um, by democracy was in terms of response by the government in terms of the services required by um, by the citizens. That's very interesting, Robin, because I mean I can can, I can relate that to the experience in Indonesia. Um, that it is about responsiveness of the government. Uh, we had, in a way, Indonesia is a very interesting case study because in 1998, when the authoritarian rule ended, we had both a democratization and a decentralization process happening at the same time. Um, so, uh, and the interesting result is, and, and so the studies that were done were econometric analysis later over the next 10, with data over the next 10 years, that showed that the decentralization process actually led to increased budget expenditures on infrastructure and the things that people really needed locally. 
whereas the electoral cycle did not have a significant effect on such um, expenditures or such improvements of um, the livelihood, if you want, of the people um, in Indonesia. So it was really decentralization that delivered, if you want, and that's basically uh, because there was the accountability now. And the interesting question then is, and I believe decentralization, meaningful one can really only work in democracy, don't you think? I mean, if there must be an ac accountability involved in all of this, and that's the democratic element. Well, I uh, I agree with you, Rainer. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, uh, and I think that you know that feeling that we're getting from from the local level is that this closest government that they have is within within probably a fifteen or twenty minutes walk, and these are elected representatives, and they can hold them accountable. So the government is really close for them. But they cannot hold accountable of the of the higher governments because, I, like I told you, we have three tiers of government, right? So they cannot hold accountable of these higher governments. Also, they don't have any businesses with the higher higher government. So if you look at, if you ask, if you if you talk to them about the perceptions of their on the higher level of governments, they're like then they start complaining about it. There's a lot of issues of corruption. There's a lot of issues of favoritism. You know, there's a lot of issues of rule of law and, you know, you know, governance, you know, and there are issues of like institutions not being in place and even institutions that exist not being able to deliver on the bigger picture. Right. So I think one of the things that uh, that I, I kind of, you know, coming back to what Tamari started with, you know, liberal democracy, I think I think one of the fundamentals I personally feel is for liberal democracy to be to be functioning and to be. Uh, to gain support, it also has to be able to build institutions that are functional. Because it's a lot of, you know, uh, liberal democracy is, is is a combination of a lot of other smaller, you know, parts, like, you know, maybe justice or maybe, you know, sort of um, implementation of competitive acts or you know, all this sort of thing or enabling the markets. And so if we are not able to institution, build these institutions and, and uh, make these institutions work, then then, you know, people tend to look for a superpower, you know, or, or someone with a great idea. And, and, you know, and, and a country like us, we're always fragile to that because we have, been a, we have been a kingdom with a king ruling for a long time. And then people would like, maybe that one man called the king is better, you know. And that is, uh, that for Asia, I, I, I see, see to it uh, as, as it is because um, the history of the larger Asian continent has been that once upon a time there has been kings and there, had, there has been mo monarchs in, in many parts of Asia. So, and people tend to, you know, kind of get back to that um, trust of a benevolent leader, you know. And, and, and many Asian countries are selling benevolent leaders and if you know it, I know it, right? So... And that is that is one of the big risks that I see, at least in our part of um, part of the continent. Robin, you just mentioned enabling the markets, which brings me to one of my questions: What role can the private sector play in all of this? Right, we've talked a lot about governance and democratic institutions. So, what do you see as the role of the private sector in? relinking markets and democracy and restoring some of this trust? Well, at least for me, I, I think it is very idealistic to think that private sector would play play a significant role in this, in coming from a country like Nepal. Because private sector does not have a very good reputation. And the reason private sector does not have a very good reputation is uh, private sector is represented by Chamber of Commerces that are merely, you know, sort of uh, merely a confederation of big businesses and interest groups. Okay, and so they have, they have, uh, they have been very, um, they have been very uh, much um, into, you know, making profit or increasing profit or subsidies or. Uh, you know, protectionism or favoritism or policy corruption. And these are not, not, the, not the larger section of private sector. This is just probably 1% of private sector, but that is, 
you know, politically representing private sector as Chamber of Commerce is. But I think it would be important in a country like Nepal is to be able to bring the voice of the small and medium entrepreneurs in, 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 in the mainstream. Because the small and medium entrepreneurs have a very big base of a stakeholder and and i think that could something be something that 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 be, uh, that private sector could do otherwise i mean you know i i don't know i'm i'm totally totally uh, you know uh, clueless on what can we do so that the private sector could open up the market or private sector could defend um, uh, you know uh, uh, um, market uh, reforms uh, well, there has been few cases, uh, so I'm 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 a bit skeptic, but I have a strong belief in small and medium enterprises, and and if we figure out ways to uplift them, and if we figure out ways to get their voices as a mainstream private sector voices, maybe that can be more helpful, uh, Tamari. Rainer, do you have any thoughts on everything Robin just said and what you see as the role of the private sector in all this? Yeah, I can only um, agree. Um, I have exactly the same opinion. That might not be very interesting for the audience, but it is the case. You know, you must just understand in a country, the government sets a certain amount of rules how to play in the market in this in this space. And those who know how to play along those rules will succeed. So that means those companies that are able to follow up or to follow everything the government has actually uh, established as the rules will be the dominant players. That means the dominant players are the ones that are close to the government, knows how to play this, uh, potentially has good relationships there. There's uh, definitely um, a level of um, corruption involved in this. You cannot even differentiate exactly what's a private company and what's the government because uh, you quite often in many countries you have um, a leader of a private company becomes a supporter of a let's say a presidential or a political candidate with his wealth and gets awarded with a ministerial position in the next cabinet so this is an in and out between the private sector and the government sector and the boundaries are quite blurred so they will have their niche, the rules that they know how to play with along these roles. So basically they are settled. And therefore, I, yeah, I agree with Robin. Um, if we really want um, equal access, equal opportunities, if we want to put away with the gatekeepers, then we need to give the smaller companies, the mid-sized companies, the chance to grow. And the real successful market economies that we know are those with a very strong SME sector um, who actually also have like the little champions um, in global markets, which are themselves just small or medium sized companies. So that must be the aim. Yes. So do you think then that with all of this, um, markets are in need of liberalization, leveling or reg more regulation? Right. If they're very, as you were saying, it's hard to tell the difference between, you know, where the private sector is and where governance is. So what do you see markets being in need of to address some of these problems? Sure. It's, it's, it is this difficult question. How can we ensure that the small, medium sized enterprises have a stronger position? And I believe what we need to do is we need to, to a certain extent, change our vocabulary. Um, if we just make it a private sector against the government, it is not really helping in countries that have this suspicion that Robin mentioned towards the private sector. They just think, aha, so a couple of cronies are going to take the cake and eat it all by themselves. So I think it's all about access and equal opportunities. And we need to tell the stories of those who do not have the uh, access, who fail to have the opportunities, even though they are qualified and and they have a really interesting service or product that they want to offer, but they were blocked and they were not able to actually bring this forward. So we need to tell the stories of those and try to see whether they, we can ensure that they actually have a chance. Um, whether that requires more regulations or less regulations, um, that's hard to say. That really depends on a local context. Uh, it definitely requires a different set 
of regulations, those that facilitate access and not restrict access. And that, I believe, is, is an opening of markets that I would definitely think many countries need. Uh, to add on to Reiner, I mean, our experience in Nepal has been that for some weird reasons, we, our, the amount of compliance and laws that we have in Nepal is exorbitant. And, uh, you know, it's just, people are just scared of to start a business and a better choice is to go abroad to work. So, so that we have like, you know, a huge exodus of young people going, um, going abroad for better opportunities. Uh, and, you know, when we think about this, the closest example I can see is in the, in the, in the last two decades of Indian, you know, sort of reform, whatever has happened in India. One of the things they did brilliantly was they scrapped away thousands of laws that were redundant. And probably for a country like Nepal, that is a big lesson that we could, uh, we also have thousands of laws that, uh, that, uh, that are redundant and we need to scrap off. Only that we don't, we lack the same political will and, and, and the resource probably on what needs to be scrapped off. So I think there is a space for think tanks like us uh, and, and ships and many other around across Asia to be able to bring those, you know, abundant, those, you know, unnecessary laws on the table and say, if we scrap this up, you know, maybe things will be better for people, easier to access. And people want, and, and Nepal, I mean, interesting uh, uh, might be for you. Uh, I don't know if, if you share the same in Indonesia or rest of Asia, but Nepal, I mean, the informal economy is almost 45%. And people are doing business, but they're doing it informally. And they're doing it informally because it is very expensive to be formal. Right? And, I, and we've been arguing with the uh, with the policymakers, that can it can we make it zero cost to be formal? It doesn't hurt us, and at least the size of our formal economy grows, right? So I think these are the kind of you know things that we might be might help us. But then again, um, the daunting task is we have to educate more people, we have to ad educate more influencers, we have to produce more evidence. Uh, and and probably um, you know being being true to democracy, um, you know raise a rally uh, or raise a voice for these kind of reforms in, in in Asian countries. We've spoken about some of the challenges kind of at length throughout this podcast. Are there any opportunities that you see that you know members of the network or others who are advocating for democracy and open markets should be seizing within asia you know for asia one of the short window of opportunities for for a lot of us to think is the you know uh, is the population or the demographic dividend right this is going to remain for a short time probably 10 years 20 years but for the time being, we're one of the more, we're one of the largest young population in the world. Asia itself is 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 one big large population. So I think this is an this is an opportunity in in policy terms to be able to say, okay, how can we quickly use this to make life better for our people? Because this is not going to stay forever. We're already seeing tendencies of decline, including you know, my country, India or, or China, everywhere, this is going to go into decline. And this is going to be a short window of opportunity. I see that there are opportunities to advocate for reform and help our population prosper. I mean, because we are a big population, we are also a big market. And so, so uh, that's, I think, a great population, that opportunity that we could make a case for. So that's, uh, that's where I see. Well, then let me add another one that I can see. And that is, you know, over the last decades, we have seen the, the center of the global economy slowly moving from the west towards the east. And it's somewhere in the middle now, but uh, it definitely was just in the West, and that's not any more the case. It's not at all any more the case. Um, as I said earlier, we have India and China as the um, global economic giants, but then we have also Japan, Korea, etc. So it's it's quite a lot of economically strong countries, and that gives us an enormous amount of case studies on how opening up investment and trade regimes 
are actually beneficial to people. China itself is a great example of how when they open up, they actually um, reduced poverty enormously. Um, and that's just opening up to the outside world, but also internally when they allowed all the migration inside China. Um, Korea and uh, Japan are both examples of how when they started to look at an export-oriented economic growth model, they were enormously benefiting and, I mean, shot to a level of income that they've never seen before. And then we have Southeast Asia, which is famous for being winners of, of, of uh, globalization like Singapore um, and several other countries in the region. So we have lots of uh, cases where we can see how it works. And now we have a new development. We have a net outflow of FDI from China now for a couple of years in a significant amount. We have a many uh, have adopted the China plus one strategy or the ABC anywhere but China strategy. So they're looking for other destinations. And now is a competition to attract those investments. And Vietnam is very far ahead by de deregulating uh, their economy by making it easier to invest in Vietnam. So they are doing very well in this. Thailand is trying to do this to attract electric vehicles and others, etc. So um, that's a great example to see how if you open up, if you integrate in global supply chains, global value chains, um, you really can benefit from what's happening in the world. Thank you both. As we approach our time, I would love to give you the opportunity to share any final thoughts, if there's anything that I missed asking about that you would like to share. On a closing thought, um, I think what I'd like to stress up, uh, upon is, you know, I mean, all this throughout histories and centuries, um, uh, we've seen that the only way to create wealth has been businesses and entrepreneurs irrespective of whether uh, we like them or not, opening the environment or making it easier for entrepreneurs to do more um, is the best way to prosperity. Um, but if we, like, if we like prosperity and if we desire prosperity, I think we have to work towards making that happen for, uh, for you know, entrepreneurs. That's, that's what I think uh, as a summary. And for me, I would like to end with a word of, concern. Um, what we have seen is China has grown more and more protectionist um, and installed an industrial policy in order to grow its own domestic industries. And uh, other countries are concerned about that. But what they do is they respond with the same set of policies uh, with trade restrictions, investment restrictions, etc. So we have that in the United States, we have that in European Union. Um, and now we see in Southeast Asia, they are worried that when U.S. and Europe close their markets, all these goods from China will be dumped in Southeast Asia. And I think also in South Asia, there's the same concern. So are we then going to be the grounds where all of this is going to be dumped? So they are starting to become more protectionist. And I'm, at the moment, I'm worried about this resurgence of industrial policy when we have seen so clearly how open global uh, economic cooperation has benefited people so much that poverty in Asia has gone down tremendously because of these activities. So I'm a little worried with what's going on at the moment with the industrial policy that's coming back. Thank you both so much for joining us today and for sharing your insights into the region. This has been a really great conversation. To our listeners, the next Free Enterprise and Democracy Network conference is coming up soon on October 8th. Learn more and register at fedin.sipe.org. Thank you so much. Listen and subscribe to Sipe's Democracy That Delivers wherever you get your podcasts.